Without any further ado, help me welcome Keith Riopel to talk about the findings and recommendations of the Dane County Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. This is a fabulous turnout. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, I promise I'm going to keep this brief overview of uh, a look uh, in some insights on the Climate Action Plan for Dane County to 10 minutes. So I'm just putting my phone here because I'm not in view of a, a, a clock, so I can uh, try to stick to that promise. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give a the, the Climate Action Plan, I apologize, is, is, is not here in written form. Um, it is being designed and edited uh, as we speak. Um, so it's, it's all written, um, and it will be out in the coming weeks. So it'll be out soon, I promise. Um, but I am going to give you sort of a preview, and so I appreciate this opportunity to do that. Uh, I'm going to start out just by pointing out the obvious that this is all about um, climate and climate impacts. Um, we're familiar with the tremendous flooding that we've had in Dane County and southern Wisconsin in general of late and what a huge problem that is. One of the great things um, that you'll find in this climate action plan is some of the latest climate science by the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. Um, they redid their modeling. A lot of you are familiar with their 2011 uh, climate assessment document book. Um, they've redone all the modeling that they did for that, and I, I think, I don't quote me on this, but I think this is the first place you'll see a somewhat complete overview of the results of that modeling. And this is one map from that modeling uh, pointing out that the number of rainfall events where we have five inches or more of rainfall are going to uh, increase in southern Wisconsin um, a lot. We'll have five or six of those uh, every hundred years um, in that ballpark. There's another, um, there's another graphic in the Fourth National Climate Assessment which makes a really important point about climate science which is that, and precipitation, which is that the larger the rainfall events are going to proportionately occur more often than, than smaller ones. So that's not to say we're going to have more, you know, 14 inch rainfall events than we are going to have two inch rainfall events. It means that the 14 inch rainfall events are going to happen more frequently in a relative sense than the two inch rainfall events. And so um, we're in for a lot more flooding is the, is the point there. Um, I would just want to say a little bit about put Dane County in the context of climate action. Dane County has been a leader for a long, long time thanks to uh, my boss, uh, County Executive Joe Parisi and his predecessors. Um, if you're not familiar with the Yale climate opinion maps, you should become familiar with them. Um, you can, you'll see in those maps, if you just Google Yale climate opinion, you'll see a map of the United States, States by county. And what you'll see there is that people in Dane County um, are more concerned about climate and want to see more done about climate than any other county, for the most part, in Wisconsin and, um, and you know, not surprisingly, Cook County, Hennepin County are, are others in the Midwest that, that care more than average, let's say. Um, Dane County government has already been up to 100% renewable energy in terms of our operations and facilities. We are not at the moment. We were as of about a year ago. And then we switched, um, the picture in the lower right hand corner there is a picture of a uh, facility at the landfill, the Rotafeld landfill, where we're taking the methane from the landfill that used to generate electricity and we're now putting that methane into an interstate pipeline and it's being used for clean transportation fuel. Um, and so that's why we're no longer at 100% because we're not generating that electricity, but we have a plan and we'll be back up to 100% soon. Um, I am the director uh, for the last two and a half years. I've spent um, mostly working on developing the Climate Action Plan. I'm the director of the Office of Energy and Climate Change. We're the only such office uh, at the county level in the state of Wisconsin. And when we release this Climate Action Plan, I'm pretty certain that we will be the only county in the state of Wisconsin that has a Climate Action Plan. Um, just a little bit about the process to develop the Climate Action Plan. You see here um, sort of the categories of stakeholders that were involved in a 38 organizational member climate council. Um, met 10 times over the course of about a year and a half to help develop the climate action plan. 
um, the Ho Chunk Nation, you will also see um, an, another um, teaser here. They have a tremendously critical and important section in the Climate Action Plan, so they played a major role. Um, utilities played a major role. There were five, um, five municipalities and other government agencies, um, organizations, 12 businesses, and, and you can see the rest of the list there. So diverse stakeholders. Um, the Climate Action Plan is, I like to say, and I've said this from day one, at the first Climate Council meeting, it's gonna be based on climate, um, sorry, on science and evidence, and um, that absolutely is the case. We were really fortunate that in the middle of developing this plan, two really seminal um, reports on climate change came out in the lower left-hand corner, the fourth national climate assessment, and in the upper right-hand corner, the uh, one and a half degree report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Those two reports alone just gave us a wealth of information to base, a wealth of science to base this on. And then the deep decarbonization pathways um, sort of lays out the general, uh, the general plan for how you get to deep decarbonization or roughly zero carbon emissions um, by, by mid-century. Um, and there's a plan like that for um, at least 13 nations in the, in the world that produce about 75% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Um, and of course, the U.S. is one of those, and that's the U.S. plan. I'm going to try to spend most of the rest of my time talking about um, recommendations in the plan for policies and programs and projects that will get us to deep decarbonization here in Dane County. And again, um, this is county-wide, economy-wide. I, I mentioned that the county itself, its own operations and facilities have already been uh, up to as high as 100% uh, renewable electricity. But now this plan is not about the county's facilities and operations. This plan is about every home owner and renter and business in Dane County and how together all of us can get uh, on a path to deep decarbonization and get to where that one and a half degree IPCC report tells us we need to get. Um, this is just a, there's about 110 recommendations for different policies and programs in the Climate Action Plan. Um, this is just uh, a, a few of the, say, more higher policies, um, bigger, broader types of policies. Um, we anticipate, um, we plan to put together a energy efficiency program that's countywide, specifically for Dane County. Probably everybody in the room is familiar with the Focus on Energy program at the state level. Um, we, we are planning to leverage uh, Focus on Energy resources and a lot of other resources to have a, a not too dissimilar plan for energy efficiency work at the county level. Um, we also uh, have recommendations about new buildings and building renovation. An energy efficiency plan will, um, will be largely about retrofitting existing buildings, but then we'll have another effort that's specifically for new construction and renovation, which uh, will help builders and developers in Dane County build to a much higher level of efficiency, including, and at the highest level, net zero energy buildings uh, in Dane County. Um, we have a high level recommendation to get uh, by 2030 one third of all of our electricity from renewable resources or that is to say to meet one third of all of our energy use demands in Dane County economy wide again through solar power and to do that would require developing about 1200 megawatts of solar power in Dane County. Uh, to give you some sense I know that number means very little to almost everybody but um, but to give you a sense, we have a project out at the airport where we're developing 57 acres. We're going to cover 57 acres with solar panels, and that will generate about 9 megawatts of electricity. So we need to, we need to put enough solar panels uh, on the rooftops and landscape to generate 1,200 to get to that one th meeting one-third of our electricity. Um, bio CNG, I mentioned the clean... Um, transportation fuel out at the landfill. We can talk about that if you have questions in more depth. It's an amazing story. We're doing things out there literally that no other landfill in the United States has done um, in terms of that clean energy, uh, clean transportation um, fuel. That is a, uh, a compressed gas truck there in the picture, just to give you a sense. Right behind the cab, that stack you see, that rectangle, that's where all the gas is stored in the truck. Um, we have, I have a few more there, but we'll get into those if, 
if uh, you're interested when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, solar farms, a lot of that 1,300 megawatts is obviously going to have to be um, on the landscape and um, in rural areas, and it's going to be in the form of solar farms. I just have this slide to point out there's at least six easily identifiable, really enormous benefits, not the least of which are preserving farmland, and again, we can talk more about this if you have specific questions about it, but preserving farmland and preserving farms, farmers. Um, we have so many farms going out of business across, across Wisconsin, and particularly southern Wisconsin, um, and uh, solar farms like the Badger Hollow project uh, that MG&E uh, is purchasing electricity from um, absolutely help keep some of those farmers in farming. Uh, water quality, flood retention, and of course clean electricity. Um, I mentioned um, new building guidelines, and this picture shows you a little a bit of green infrastructure as well, which you're going to hear a lot more about in a minute. Um, but those um, building guidelines are are critical. Um, it's important to understand that we do not have historically in Wisconsin, local municipalities could set their own building codes for commercial buildings and have them be more aggressive in terms of things like energy efficiency. The state legislature um, took away that power from local municipalities um, about six years ago or so. And um, so now we can't do it by code, but we can create a program which would um, offer um, higher efficiency building guidelines and training, and that's our intent uh, in Dane County. Um, one of the more unique, maybe, uh, recommendations is a recommendation to create clean energy districts in Dane County, and um, the, the six bullet points, seven bullet points, just show you different aspects that we um, envision for these clean energy districts. The way to think about this is the top three renewable, having multiple renewable resources of electric generation, having a dedicated energy efficiency program or offering of some type, and having clean mobility um, op options, um, whether they're vehicle chargers or um, uh, clean vehicle transit or ride sharing or vehicle sharing. Those are all ways the, the top three would have to be met our sort of requirements to designate, uh, and it could be a, a neighborhood, uh, could be a, a village, it could be an industrial park, it could really be any community of people or businesses, of homes or businesses, that we would designate as clean energy districts. And the first three would have to be met, and then the other four you'd have to be making um, that that geographic um, area, the businesses and homeowners there would have to be making a commitment to work with the Dane, with Dane County on the other four. That's kind of how that would work. I'm excited about, um, I don't have time to get into it, but a research and development program. Again, those of you who are familiar with Focus on Energy and familiar enough to know that there was once was an environmental R&D program as much as well, several million dollars a year going into research and development. Think of research and development for better ways to um, transition to clean electricity, to transition to clean transportation, um, and we, we want to develop a fund and an R&D fund at the county level. Um, I think I have two more substantive slides. Getting back to the idea of this um, plan is based on science and evidence. We have world-class modeling that was done with this plan, and basically what this, what this uh, slide shows you is that all of those 110 recommendations taken together uh, get us to um, roughly, well, what the IPCC again told us in the one and a half degree report, we need to get a 45% reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The modeling showed that we can do a little better than that even uh, if we successfully implement the recommendations in this plan. The top group of lines there, and the important thing to know about that graph is it's not, zero is not at the bottom of the axis, right? So it's not that we're reducing our emissions by you know that much if it went down to zero, but it's taking it from 7,500 million metric tons to you know somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, three million. But the top bunch of lines are actually, sort of think of them as business as usual um, lines. There will be a lot of reductions just because renewable energy is very cost effective today, and more and more people are gonna buy electric vehicles. But then the bottom four lines are the various sort of categories of recommendations. You can talk more about that modeling if you want to. And then next steps. Um, 
They fall into two get categories. Excuse me one second. So when the, after the plan comes out in a couple of weeks, um, and, and we've already begun this work, of course, but the next steps are to engage the public, engage communities a lot more to help us figure out how to take these high-level recommendations for, for a variety of policies and programs and figure out the details of how we can implement them. And really importantly, the details of how we can implement them um, in a just and equitable way. And we can make sure to deliver the benefits of these programs to those um, most vulnerable communities and most vulnerable individuals in Dane County. Um, so public outreach will be a big part of the next step. And then the other part is really figuring out, um, putting the programs together, figuring out the delivery, the design of the programs that will um, deliver the recommendations. And you see a, a, a few different ideas there. We, we really want um, everybody's input um, in this room. We, want, we need climate stories. We need to hear about climate observations. We need more ideas about the best ways to get 1,200 megawatts of solar power um, in Dane County, to get um, uh, also a lot of wind power, a lot more wind power in Dane County or, or surrounding southern Wisconsin counties to transition, to reduce our vehicle miles traveled, and um, to get high levels of energy efficiency done. So all of those things. And um, the fact that this is so interesting, this goes back to the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. That's where you can find the study that this graph is in. But it basically points out that Latino people in America um, care significantly more about climate change than any other ethnic um, ethnicity or uh, any other race, which is really interesting, right? And um, even more so than Native Americans, as it turns out. So three and four Latinos are worried about global warming, sort of the highest rate that, that those studies found. So um, it's just uh, uh, a fascinating study that tells us, you know, why one of the reasons it's so critical to engage everybody. Um, I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Sophia Sol, who also works in the Office of Energy and Climate Change. And Sophia has been uh, very busy putting together a white paper about green infrastructure that she's going to tell you about now. Thank you, Keith, for I'm going to time that too, so in five minutes. Um, um, thank you, Sustain Dane, uh, for an amazing opportunity today. Um, and I am Sophia Sol, Clean Energy Specialist in Dane County Office of Energy and Climate Change. So, um, I have been researching and writing Green Infrastructure White Paper as we found a gap in green infrastructure in Dane County. And so, this white paper includes definition of a green infrastructure to cost and benefit of um, analysis of a green roof. So to help you um, understand better in terms of a green infrastructure. So let's jump right in. Um, types, of course these are only a few types of a green infrastructure. We have about 13 types in the white paper, including amazing um, examples around the world. So if you're interested, we actually have a copy with Kathy here. Um, so you can have it, you can look at it that, or you can actually go to our website and download it. Um, so, Rain Garden, they are watered by the collective storm water, uh, storm water runoff. Um, it slowly filtrates into the soil, which reduces um, water pollution and adding aesthetics. Biosolar is indicating bi solar panels on top of a green roof. Um, green roof, in general, is indicating a vegetated roof that includes uh, growing medium, waterproofing, and drainage system. And that retains rainwater, increase, increasing property value, um, energy saving with the insulation effect. Um, it also adds aesthetics, as you can see in the picture right here. It shows the Miraki Public Library. Um, they actually allow people to come up to the roof and actually learn about biosolar and green roof in general. So more public engagement and education is possible. Um, with employees who are more exposed to green infrastructure, like green roofs or green walls, um, they are likely to have a higher productivity. Um, and green wall is very unique. Um, they have, they could be installed internal wall or external wall. 
Um, you can have a, attractive design features, um, it builds insulation, um, that saves energy, and also reducing um, sick building syndrome, which is caused by uh, inadequate ventilation or chemical contaminants in the air. That makes you sick. So benefits. Um, we talked about how green infrastructure is improving air and water quality. Um, it improves productivity and health. Um, and also aesthetics, as you can see in the picture right here, it's showing a Whole Foods market in Chicago that is covering with this beautiful green wall of that four building. It's covering three walls out of the four walls. Um, and it allows more neighborhoods, people in the neighborhoods to be exposed to this kind of green infrastructure so more public education is possible and of course mitigation, the flooding risk. But I want to do more uh, deep dive into the benefits of green infrastructure. Pervious pavement is also considered as one of a great green infrastructure. Um, about 77% will be reduced by that um, in terms of annual salt usage during the winter maintenance. In terms of biosolar, um, solar panels efficiency goes up about the maximum 16% or even more, even more with a green roof as it cools the microclimate of the green, uh, solar panels. And this is really important to you. Uh, 15 minutes more, that's almost an hour. Uh, it will help you sleep with a better sleeping patterns and also extra 50 minutes more when you have um, the major green infrastructure types uh, that are attached or inside of the building. Um, that increases energy efficiency with higher ventilation, fresh air, natural lights, and less of uh, energy usage. Um, when GI is combined, green infrastructure is combined in uh, energy efficient measures, um, energy saving will be about 25% and water saving will be about 11%. Um, that's in terms of sustainably and properly designed buildings. And also green roofs payback years would be 6.2 years considering all the costs and co-benefits and um, the lifespan of the green roof. So we talked about all the types of benefits. Um, I kind of wanted to wrap up with uh, major characteristics of a green infrastructure. So it is very cost effective regarding the lifespan of a green infrastructure. Um, this is very, um, green infrastructure is very flexible in terms of designing. Um, these two pictures are showing the New York City uh, High Line at the top picture is showing how they embedded art within an open green space. And even though it is intensive green roof, um, you can have it on a you know, freight line like this. It doesn't have to be on top of a building to be a green roof. So it's a very flexible in terms of designing. And this is showing a uh, super tree grove in Singapore. That kind of weird <laughs> uh, but awesome structure is showing that it literally captures uh, rainwater from the top of that structure, uh, but it is wrapped up with plants that, that captures carbon and rainwater at the same time. And as you can see, there is a bridge, there are people looking at this great um, infrastructure. Um, it could be used as beautification and recreational purposes as well. And regarding uh, green infrastructure, uh, triple bottom line benefits, which is also in our white paper, so, um, it is very multifunctional and, of course, mitigating the flooding risk. Uh, the, the bottom picture here is showing the water square um, in Netherlands that literally captures water uh, when it is flooded, um, but when the weather is dry, you pick and, people can use it as a skateboarding place or play volleyball or basketball, uh, more of public uh, space for that. And with all of these together, um, Green infrastructure is building uh, resilience and will build resilience in Dane County. I hope this presentation helped you think more about and learn more about green infrastructure. Thank you. <laughs>
clean energy solutions through research, financing, education, and program implementation. Um, and I'm very excited to hear all of this. Uh, we at Slipstream are just finishing up an uh, effort to do energy plans for seven communities around Dane County. Um, and so this is very relevant and exciting to hear. Um, but I will start off our Q&A um, with one question for Keith. And uh, my, my question is, you kind of started talking about it a little bit towards the end in terms of kind of equity uh, questions or incorporating uh, or involving people of color in implementation. I'm kind of curious if you want to expand on, on that aspect of the, of the plan. Yeah, um, thanks, Jeanette. I appreciate that question a lot, in part because uh, I think I, at one point in my slide deck there, clicked the button twice and skipped over the slide that <laughs> talked about this. Um, the, slide, the title of the slide was Principles, and there are six sort of guiding principles um, that we use to put together this climate action plan. One of them is equity and justice. I'll say more about that, but now that I have the microphone, I'm gonna tell you what the other five are. One of them is economic development. Um, in, in other words, there's, you cannot transition to a clean energy economy without major economic uh, benefits, and so we wanna maximize those. Another one is health benefits. We wanna, uh, again, you're gonna see very significant health um, improvements, health, positive health outcomes. We wanna maximize those with this plan. Um, another one is to increase resiliency. Uh, this plan is about cl climate change mitigation. It's primarily about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but in doing that, you create a lot of opportunities to also adapt and become more resilient, and we want to maximize that. Uh, another one of the guiding principles is to improve ecosystem benefits. Again, there's tons of opportunities um, as you're mitigating or reducing the emissions to um, see improvement in the ecosystems. And then uh, the last one is what I like to call bridging the urban and rural divide. And um, you know, both you know, Madison and the other cities and villages uh, obviously play a critical role, and that's where majority emissions are coming from, but um, the rural parts of Dane County are also critical and um, will play a, a huge role in this. Um, back to equity. Um, so yeah, the way we sort of think of that principle is that all those other benefits I just mentioned, those other guiding principles, so economic benefits, health outcome benefits, we need to um, develop the details of how we implement these programs and we need to in, in, then in turn actually implement them in such a way that those benefits accrue to everybody in Dane County regardless of their race or ethnicity or um, income level or anything else. And so, and we have to be very, very intentional or that will not happen. So I'll just give you one example. I said we um, are going to put together a Dane County Energy Efficiency Program. So that Energy Efficiency Work Group, I mentioned there was a 38 member Climate Council. There were also 10 work groups. One of them developed energy efficiency recommendations. And an example would be that we um, are gonna target very specific sectors of the economy and so one example would be small business owners of color would be a sector or a subset of Dane County's population that we want to reach you know, first and foremost in terms of um, giving energy efficiency benefits. Thank you. Um, all right, I have another question for Sophia. Um, I'm kind of curious about um, costs when you're talking about green infrastructure, because it's always it's always uh, an aspect that people talk about, especially when you're building new projects, either make or break um, you know, the, the actual project. Um, how do these costs for kind of adding these green infrastructure elements, how should they be measured or how, how do the benefits be measured um, so that you could use that as a convincing angle for ensuring that they actually get implemented? Right, um, that's really a great question. Um, there are a variety of types of green infrastructure and that all depends on the sizes, what plant, kind of plant they're planting, um, and in terms of you know, rain gardens, there are plenty of other plants that you can embed or other green roofs that have like three types, which is expensive, semi-intensive, and intensive. So the more intensive it is, the more expensive it will be. We do have a lot of examples in the white paper that you can look at. Um, some of them don't have a cost uh, you know, um, information, but um, it is pretty common. Um, but 
Regarding, since the actual numbers are different, we, I found that there are general services administration who conducted cost and benefit analysis of a green roof, and the net, pro um, I have to read the offer, um, net present value, which is a measure that shows uh, potential profitability of an investment, um, it's more, um, with the installation, maintenance costs will be expensive. However, when you consider the stormwater fees or um, the reduced infrastructure improvements or energy savings, it will be positive. And so that shows that it is how uh, it could be cost effective in, ter in terms of a long run. And especially with the green roof, it's, the lifespan it would be like up to 50 years. So when you consider a lot lifespan, it will be cost effective. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to open this up to the audience to see if there are any questions. I know I feel like there's a lot percolating, um, so we're just going to get started. And I think there's a microphone um, going around, so yeah. I had a quick question for each of the panelists. Um, first, Keith, about the, you wanted to talk, and I'm interested to hear more, about the methane pipeline project. I know very little about it, so if you can. And I wanted to ask Sophia about this connection between uh, green roofs and solar panels. It sounded like you could have both, and that confused me, because I sort of uh, think about a green roof. Where do the panels go if you've got all the vegetation up there? Right. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, right around, I, I mentioned that for a while, we had generated uh, electricity at the landfill from the methane gas from the landfill. And right around Earth Day last year, we switched over and instead put that methane, well, first you have to clean it up. The gas that comes out of the landfill is maybe, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but 50, 60% methane and a bunch of other stuff, including CO2. And you have to strip all that other stuff out. And then when you have almost pure methane, you can put it in the interstate pipeline you don't, of course, know, just like electricity, you don't know where the electrons are going or being used, and it's the same thing in a gas pipeline. You know, that gas is going to heat buildings or provide transportation fuel. But there's several markets out there which require, um, require trans clean transportation fuel. The, the big one is the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard. That's the standard that has resulted in having ethanol gas at all gas stations, right? So. That standard requires a certain amount of cleaner um, transportation fuel, and there's a, a market for that. It's called the RINS market. And anyway, we will, you know, recoup the cost, you know, by selling credits to those like fleets of trucks that have to use that gas. Right? There's other markets though. There's the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard market, and that works differently. And that's all about carbon emission reductions. Um, we probably, I, I don't know this for certain yet, um, we're not selling credits into that market. It's not clear that we'll be able to, and it's partially because the green, the climate change effect of that gas from the landfill is not as great as other sources. For example, and here's the, the punchline of this. I, I said there's things we're doing that nobody else is doing, and what I was referring to there is we not only are taking our methane gas and putting it in that pipeline, but we have the infrastructure there to offload trucked compressed gas from other sources such as uh, manure digesters. Uh, and so manure digesters can bring their gas to our landfill and we can put it in the pipeline. The gas from a manure digester has the highest score of any gas in the low carbon, in the California low carbon fuel standard market. And so the fascinating thing about that, and this is really more of a good news thing for water quality than it really is clean energy um, locally, that at least. Um, there's a certain radius around Dane County or around our landfill that we don't, we don't know the exact radius, but there's a certain radius where the economics of manure uh, digesters has gone from terrible uh, when we flipped the switch last uh, April to excellent. Um, and so there's, gonna, there's suddenly a huge economic incentive to build more digesters, which is fascinating. We're the only landfill in the nation that's been permitted by EPA to take that gas from other sources and put it into that pipeline. Um, in terms of the biosolar, um, 
you can be you can install solar on top of a green roof, which could be built in literally with the green roof, or they have a green roof tray that has about 24 inches, 24 inches is a, it's about like four inch and eight inch deep. deep. And so um, you can have a little bit, like half 50% of a green roof, and the other half you can have a solar. But, but at the same time, it could be installed together, as you saw the images of a green uh, Milwaukee Public Library, and we also have biosolar in Madison Public Library. So it is pretty um, plausible project. Just to add to that, this is so fascinating. I, I, this was a new thing to me until Sophia started doing research. Um, so what's really cool is that because the green roof is, has insulated for, you know, qualities and because it cools, literally cools the environment near it, the, the solar panels on, on top of the green roof actually are significantly more efficient. They generate more clean energy than they would on a regular roof. And it's, you, what are the numbers? Do? It's like the maximum would be the 16% and some of them like 20%. So like any, I think the number is in the white paper, something like five to 16% more right. efficient, which is just sort of mind blowing. But the other thing is you can, they coexist easily be, in part because even if you have a huge solar farm like Badger Hollow, it turns out that only about 40% of the land is actually covered by solar panels. There's, there's a lot of land between the solar panels as well. And so they, you know, you can grow, you know, just about anything in between them and, and under them. Looks like we have a question. Um, I'll let Lorenzo kind of fire. Thank you. Uh, great plan. It sounds wonderfully detailed. Um, 2030 is fast approaching. I'm wanting to get the have you forecast? You have to go by 2030. Um, when do these elements have to be in place to achieve that goal? And do we have the political will to get there? <laughs> um, great. Great questions, Warren. Appreciate both of them. Um, so, yeah. So, I, just to give a little context of that 2030, and I, and I hinted at this, but so what that one and a half degree report by the IPCC says is, you know, to keep warming to one and a half degrees, we have to basically get to roughly net carbon neutral by mid-century, and then in order to get there they um, went further to say that we need to get a 45% reduction in those emissions by 2030. So, and you know, this climate action plan, you know, what, there's a next step section and the next step se section says, this needs to be rewritten or, or not rewritten, but needs to be amended, uh, you know, every three or four years, you know, because the world changes so fast, technology changes so fast, markets change so fast. So it's really, um, you know, I, I guess in, sort of my mind, it's, it's very helpful for the next 10 years. I don't know how helpful it is beyond that, right? So we don't have in there, like, some of the recommendations speak to a timeline. Um, the conversion of half of the diesel heavy duty vehicles in Dane County to, um, to renewable natural gas, compressed gas, for example, um, I think there's a specific date you know, that we get a certain amount of that done by the year 2026. Most of the recommendations don't have that sort of, aren't dissected quite that much, or, or nearly that much. So um, you, your point's a really good one, but we just have to do as much as fast as we can, pretty much. What was the second half? Oh, political will, political will. The great thing about this plan is that, um, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that Dane County, you know, can't regulate our way to deep decarbonization. Um, and, and even in areas where at one time we, we could do some of that, uh, a lot of it's been preempted by the legislature. Um, but this, this climate action plan um, is all about what we can do now. And so it doesn't require any you know, regulatory changes really. Um, I mean, the sad news is it's a lot of voluntary programs, but the good news is it's, it's voluntary programs and we can do this stuff now. I, I've heard you talk about national incentives and other incentives. Uh, I haven't heard much talk about the value of um, ecosystem services. Uh, are those uh, fully accounted for? Because um, when you actually convert the value of avoiding flooding into dollars, it's a huge amount that can shift the economic incentive to make businesses want to do, uh, make those changes without being forced. 
Is that uh, quantified in the report, or is that used as an incentive? Thank you. Um, that's another great question. Um, to be totally honest, we started the Climate Council work and started developing this plan with five guiding principles. When the UN report you know, came out last spring that said that there are, what did it say, that there is how many million species you know, in danger of extinction globally, um, and then it broke that down by you know, every major ecosystem on Earth, um, it would, you know, my feeling was, okay, now that we have that information, and, and I thought about ecosystem benefits from day one, I honestly did, but I, I knew, you know, I couldn't include every, every benefit, um, or, you know, this, it's already taken six months longer than I expected, it would have taken another six years. So anyway, um, we add, that was actually an add-on, um, partway through the process, I'm really glad that we added it, I think it's really critical, I, my, bachelor's degrees in wildlife ecology, it's actually the thing that I'm most jazzed about, um, but I resisted for a while, but I'm really glad we put it in there. The short answer is no. We talk qualitatively, and that slide that I showed about the solar farms is, you know, a really good example of, um, it talk, the report talks qualitatively about stacking those benefits and the value of stacking those benefits. There's an economic benefits section in the report which actually goes into um, a fair bit of detail about studies that talk about, you know, the benefits of acting on climate change versus, you know, not acting on climate change. And it, and a lot of, there are a lot of studies out there that monetize that. How, do they do a good job of including ecosystem benefits in that? No, I'm sure they don't. But the numbers are impressive even without that. All right, if we have, can we raise those hands high? Um, oh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> So I'm curious, um, I, I know there could be information overload, but how much you look at international cities and some of the initiatives that have been going on in China and Singapore and things they've been doing. I know one example, Shenzhen has done a lot. I think they had 90% of the electric bus fleet. I'm just kind of curious of how that's playing in. How many, how many interns work at Sustained Dane? These, that, these have to be planted questions. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So we have a section in the Climate Action Plan on who are the world leaders. Now, it is, um, it is admittedly um, very limited in one way, and that is um, so Sophia is our uh, third or fourth terrific, uh, well, she's no longer an intern, um, but she was last fall, and, but she was the third or fourth or fifth in a series of really great interns, and one of those interns um, was here from Denmark, and we took advantage of her expertise, and I, I say it's limited, there's a section on the global leaders, but it's really primarily limited to Europe and specifically the Nordic countries. Now the fact is, the Nordic countries, um, by almost any measure, are the world leaders in climate action, and um, there's a table in the report that shows you, you know, I, I told you the sort of big dates for, you know, our emission reductions by when, you know, some of the, I think, Sweden is the most aggressive. I think they have, well, it, it shows cities and, and it shows cities in Europe um, and cities and counties in the United States. And there are cities in, in Sweden, you know, that have plans to be carbon neutral, you know, before 2030. You know, I mean, they're just way, way ahead. Norway has a higher penetration of electric vehicles than any country on earth, and nobody is even close. Norway is, I don't know the exact number of that penetration, but they're just way ahead of the rest of the world. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in there um, about world leaders and, and the Nordic countries, but green infrastructure, there's also some, some information on green infrastructure, not nearly the detail that Sophia's gone into, um, and again, some of the best examples of those are in um, Nordic countries. But I'm going to give the microphone to Sophia because I think she knows of some things happening in other parts of the world. Um, so, of course, I totally agree what Keith says. Uh, we have about um, two major uh, examples that shows in the city of Basel in Switzerland that actually have um, regulatory laws that impl to implement green infrastructure on the new and redeveloping buildings. 
Um, they had in total now have like 20% of their total roof to be green roof. Um, they are about capturing, they're saving about 4 million or even more energy savings in terms of that. Um, uh, we also have other Netherlands examples in the white paper, but in terms of Asian regions, um, Singapore is really leading a lot because they are uh, in a humid area, but they also have plenty of native plants that have innovative ideas to implement green infrastructure. And so um, I would add that as um, adding more answers to yours. You touched on this earlier, um, but I'm interested in rollout. What you're, I think you said uh, that that's the next step, but one of the challenges that the SNC, as you've heard Jeanette can talk about, mm -hmm. has always been to try to find ways to communicate to people what what's going on and what's going on with this plan, especially because as you said, this plan is focused on them, not on county loan structures, but on the county itself and who lives there. So can you perhaps talk a little bit more about what your thoughts might be along those lines? Um, so yeah, so uh, Richard, you're asking primarily about rollout and our plans for rollout and, and public and engagement, public engagement. Um, is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, another great question. Um, this is um, uh, really exciting. I'm, I'm super excited. And, and one of the reasons I'm so excited, and I know there's a, a, a more than a handful of folks in the room who know Kathy Kuntz, and Kathy Kuntz came on board um, with the Office of Energy and Climate Change uh, in November of last year, and she's really, you know, she's going to take a lead on implementation of, of um, many of the recommendations, but she's also taking a lead on um, working with DesignCraft, who is also in the room. Um, I have to be careful about what I say about rollout to some extent because because Yvette is sitting in the back of the room and she's still editing what I'm what I've written, <laughs> what a, what a bunch of us have written. Um, but anyway, um, it's really exciting because DesignCraft is also helping us with social media. And um, between um, another staff person at OECC, Kelly Osborne, and Kathy Kuntz, and uh, the folks at DesignCraft, we've redone our website, which really desperately needed it. Um, and we have a number of things planned for the launch on our website. The website will play a really major role. We will have four different ways, at a minimum, four different ways for people to get immediately involved in helping to implement this climate action plan. Um, most, of them involve, most of them involve sharing information and ideas with us and will in turn, sh and stories, especially stories, which we'll in turn share with the rest of Dane County on that website. Um, but yeah, so, walk, so look at um, OEC, Office of Energy and Climate Change, Dane Climate Action um, URL. I'll look at that website and, and watch it as we as the launch um, comes near. It'll it'll be out in February. Um, uh, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, does the report look at the role of um, carbon in the in new construction? So for example, concrete and steel are the most energy intensive and carbon intensive aspects of new construction. Do you look at, at that and look at opportunities to remove carbon and steel uh, from new construction, especially with all the advancements in um, wood building and things like that? Um, not nearly to the extent that I would like it to is the honest answer. Um, it looks mostly at new construction in terms of energy um, and energy use. Um, there are aspects of the plan and the modeling that actually do a really sophisticated job of looking at you know, what are often referred to as scope three emissions or upstream emissions. And in some areas, mainly energy, um, it does a great job of including you know, those types of emissions. But in terms of you know, products and resources, you know, not so much. Um, to be honest, and, and this is one of the reasons that it has to be updated you know, before too long, there's a number of areas that we just, just didn't get to. We just ran out of bandwidth, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. I mean, an important one is grid modernization in the, in the energy sector, which it does a pretty good job of you know, coverage, but even there, um, we really didn't get at grid modernization, uh, dis distribution grid, 
modernization, which is really, really important in terms of energy use. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in there on, uh, on um, the circular economy and moving you know, um, waste materials to become resources and that sort of thing. So it, there's a lot of great stuff on materials in the sense of the life cycle emissions of those materials, um, but not specifically as much in the actual construction. Um, and that's something we'd love your help with if you know a lot about it. All right, so I think um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up with a couple with a last question for each of our panelists, um, and and then we'll uh, I'm sure these guys are gonna stay after for more if there's other questions out there. Um, but it's the new year, it's 2020, it's January. Um, obviously, the cap is coming out. The climate action plan is coming out soon, and there's a lot looking for. And the green infrastructure plan just came out. Um, you know, what do you see in this new year? And I encourage you to be give concrete examples. What are you excited about? What do we want to leave here, this room, um, imparting on everybody here about your excitement for the upcoming year in terms of what you want to get done reg regarding each of your plans? Wow. Um, <laughs> I know well, that we want to <laughs> develop and launch 110 programs in Dane <laughs> County <laughs> to get us on the path to deep decarbonization. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say two things. Um, first, I'll, I'll, first of all, it's a, you know, this uh, April 22nd will be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and that is a huge opportunity for all kinds of reasons. And I just urge everybody in the room, I know, you know a lot of people in the room are um, planning, doing lots of planning for that already and have lots of great programs and um, events that they're planning. And I just want to encourage you know, as much collaboration as possible you know, let us know how we can make your events and your plans, you know, um, stronger. So just put out that um, offer. Love to collaborate on, you know, uh, how we how we take advantage of that tremendous opportunity, that tremendous legacy. Then I'll just give I'll just give one very specific example because it um, is it's really important because it gets to equity and justice. Um, there are a number of recommendations in the plan that we're, we've been pursuing, we've been implementing already that, you know, we're, there was no reason to, to wait till the plan came out. And I'll give you one example, affordable housing. Affordable housing is a huge social issue in Dane County, across the whole county. It's really, um, really important and, and we have, a, you know, a real shortage of affordable housing. Dane County gives out grants every year so roughly, every year it's a different amount, but say in the ballpark of maybe five, six million dollars of grants to help get affordable housing built. And um, this, um, the grants we gave out last year for the first time um, ever will include all, all of the projects. We put in an extra incentive to put solar panels on affordable housing, and we got 15 bids or, or proposals of affordable housing, 13 of them included solar, and I, um, I think we are awarding six grants, so six affordable buildings, affordable housing buildings will be built with that money, um, and all of them will have solar power on them. And the next step, we're, we're gonna meet with all those developers, and then we're gonna take another step, and a, a lot of you are familiar with um, Shri and Zeroology and what they've done with Green Cab. Well, we've had conversations um, with Sri about getting electric vehicle car sharing in affordable housing, and, and those electric vehicles would be charged by solar panels. And so we'll have um, clean vehicles and clean electricity in affordable housing. I, I, I know that will be happening, you know, beginning this year and, and into the future. So super excited about that. Um, one of the concrete plans for 2020 would be uh, providing a, a lot of lists of green infrastructure installers or designers who are uh, to be more resourceful to all small businesses or businesses who are in interested in investing in green infrastructure. And the other thing is we are looking for uh, some partnerships and programs to make up a, a couple of programs to implement uh, green infrastructure or help businesses to invest more in green infrastructure. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks. Let's give a great uh, big thanks. To our